Also, the Secretariat invites the attention of delegates in the conference room to the following. We would like to share with you the COVID-19 related precautionary measures while attending meetings at the UNCC. Observe up to two meter physical distancing while sitting in the conference room. Please sit on areas not marked with signatures. We kindly ask you not to move signatures, chairs or furniture in the room. Wear your face mask in public spaces and whenever physical distancing cannot be observed. Disposable microphone covers are available if you speak to the microphone without having your mask on. These measures are for your safety and to safeguard the well-being of us all. Thanks, thanks for your kind attention to the contents of the following video on COVID-19 for meeting participants at the UNCC. This video will now be played. Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. My name is Mark Prox, Chief Investment and Enterprise Development Section of the Trade, Investment and Innovation Division at the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific. I welcome you to the opening session of the seventh session of the Committee on Trade and Investment, which will now begin. Kindly note that remote simultaneous interpretation of the proceedings is provided by the United Nations for the purpose of facilitating communication in light of the fact that there are six official languages of the United Nations, four of which are used at ESCAP. Participants are requested to be mindful of the additional difficulties experienced by interpreters when working in remote mode and of the increased likelihood of disruptions to the audio feed to the interpreters. Only the speech or intervention in the original language is authentic and constitutes an authentic record of the proceedings. In case of any inconsistency between the interpretation and the speech or intervention in the original language, the latter shall prevail. In addition, interpreters servicing remote meetings cannot be held liable for interruption of service, pixelation, freezing, or loss of visual input, partial or complete loss of audio, audible artifacts, unauthorized access to personal or confidential data, leaking of information due to inadequate soundproofing, and or data loss. Thank you for your attention to these matters. I now have the pleasure to invite Ms. Armida Salcia Ali Shabana, United Nations Under Secretary General and Executive Secretary of the Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific to make her welcoming address. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, Asia and the Pacific member states have successfully overcome many crises while relying on trade and investment in their pursuit of sustained prosperity. Yet, 
trade in, and in particular the global framework for rules based trade is at a critical juncture. COVID-19 pandemic has led the world to witness the worst economic performance since the Great Depression of the 1930s, with global trade falling by 14.5% and global foreign direct investment falling by almost 50% in 2020. SCAP estimates that the Asia-Pacific region lost about 2.2 trillion US dollars in merchandise trade in 2020 based on pre-pandemic growth forecasts. Service trade has been hit even harder than merchandise trade, especially services related to travel, tourism, and transport. The region's resilience was particularly remarkable in the second quarter of 2020. At less than 12%, the contraction contraction in exports of the region was much smaller than the historic fall seen at the global level during that quarter. ESCAP anticipates that regional trade will rebound moderately in 2021, provided that the push towards protectionism is halted and international cooperation on curbing COVID-19 is stepped up. So there are signs that trade and investment are already recovering in the region. In the case of investment flows, the region remains among the most attractive destinations for FDI and has been the largest source of FDI globally since 2018. In 2019, before the pandemic, the region captured about 35% of global FDI inflows and was the source of 41% of global outflows. However, the performance is uneven across the sub-regions with least developed countries and other countries with special needs facing severe challenges. Other positive signs include continued regional cooperation in trade. I'm pleased to see the signing of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, or RCEP, the largest block involving trade and investment ever concluded. I'm also pleased to note that in the last quarter of 2020, Bangladesh and China completed their domestic ratification processes for the framework agreement on facilitating cross-border paperless trade and that Mongolia also completed its accession to the Asia-Pacific Trade Agreement or APTA. These developments show a continued commitment in the region to open borders and the recognition of the importance of trade and investment as engines of growth. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, with this background, allow me to convey the following key messages to you as you conduct your deliberations in the committee. First, we need to collectively reaffirm our commitments to open borders and markets, resist the temptation to take protectionist, protectionist measures, which ultimately will prove to be counterproductive. Promoting trade and investment is the core element of the strategy to recover from the crisis and build back sooner, while taking due consideration of legitimate public health concerns. Second, let us ensure trade and investment policy contribute to achieving the sustainable development goals. Future agreements on trade and investment may include provisions to increase coordination and minimize disruption in trade and supply chains in times of crisis or pandemics, and include strong and effective provisions in support of sustainable development. In support of this, the Secretariat organized a United Nations initiative on model provisions for trade in times of crisis and pandemic in regional and other trade agreements. In collaboration with WTO, UNTAD and the other United Nations regional commissions, as well as other organizations from civil society, academia, and the private sector. Over the years, our annual Asia-Pacific Trade and Investment Report, or known as APTIR, has always positioned trade and investment policy options within the framework of sustainable development, and APTIR 2021 will be no exception focusing on accelerating climate smart trade and investment. With regard to investment, the Secretariat is preparing several knowledge products to help countries more effectively leverage 
and channel FDI into priority sustainable development sectors. Third, let us promote digital trade and contactless trade facilitation. COVID-19 crisis has underscored the important role of the Framework Agreement on Paperless Trade as one important mechanism for regional cooperation. The Interim Intergovernmental Steering Group on Cross-Border Paperless Trade Facilitation concluded its sixth meeting just yesterday, and the agreement will enter into force next month. So I urge all remaining member states to complete their accession processes as soon as possible. In addition, countries can strategically harness FDI to build or expand their digital economies while also utilizing digital technologies to promote, target, and facilitate FDI. In particular, policymakers must identify specific financing needs for digital infrastructure, digital business development, and wider digital ado adoption and develop an FDI strategy to help meet these requirements. Fourth, we need to engage a wide range of stakeholders in this efforts, including business sector as the agent of trade and investment. This includes the active adoption by businesses of internationally accepted standards and principles for responsible business conduct. We are proud to be the only United Nations Regional Commission to engage business through the ESCAP Sustainable Business Network, or known as ESBN. With your support, we will continue to promote and strengthen public-private sector partnership. Fifth, I wish to re-emphasize re the need for enhanced regional cooperation and collaboration. There is a clear case to build on and expand existing cooperation framework, such as RCEP, the Paperless Trade Agreement, and APTA. Importantly, the region needs more readiness to push the frontiers of cooperation and open it up for the opportunities of post-COVID-19 recovery strategies. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we look forward to a brighter future where the pandemic can be brought under control, multilateralism can be revived, and regional cooperation strengthened. This will help the recovery of trade and investment on which so many people depend for their livelihood. It will take political will and enhance regional cooperation with the strong support of ESCAP to ensure that the Asia-Pacific region remains a leader in trade and investment-led sustainable development. I look forward to your stewardship as we continue our joint efforts to respond to the challenges before us, dealing with the pandemic and supporting the much-needed economic recovery by making trade and investment work for everyone. I close by wishing the delegates from around the region a fruitful discussion in the Committee on Trade and Investment 7 session. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ms. Amida Salcia Alicia Bana, for your welcoming address, which sets the stage for this morning's discussion. I have now the pleasure to invite Mr. Vangelis Vitalis, Deputy Secretary, Trade and Economic Group, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade of New Zealand, and the APEC 2021 Senior Officials Meeting Chair to deliver his keynote address. Thank you very much. Uh, Distinguished delegates, representatives, it is a real honor and a privilege to have this opportunity to address you on such an important topic. I've divided my presentation into sort of four key elements. First of all, to sketch a little bit of the context as we see it, including the challenges we face this year in 2021. But perhaps most importantly, to really focus on the issues that we can work together on uh, as we look ahead uh, both in our region and on trade policy more generally, and then some concluding uh, observations. My first contextual observation is that even before COVID-19 uh, struck, the, the golden weather for international trade policy has effectively ended. I say the golden weather because I believe, uh, my uh, country believes that the golden weather started for us in 1994 with the establishment of the World Trade Organization, which brought into the international trading system, first of all, agriculture, 
a crucial sector, not just for my country, but for many developing and least developed countries. And critically, it made the rules on agriculture legally enforceable. In other words, even small countries like mine, uh, where we felt that we were being cheated by a, la uh, a larger uh, country, we could take them to court to a dispute settlement system in, the, in Geneva at the World Trade Organization and successfully uh, win a case and then have that larger country bring its regime into compliance. And New Zealand has a proud record of taking such dispute settlement cases against uh, almost all of the major economies of the world over the past uh, 15 years. So the first that we had that governed the golden weather since 1994 was the enforceability of those rules. The second was that fundamentally markets would become more open over time. And indeed, that is exactly what has happened, as we've just heard uh, from the earlier presentation, that the inexorable trend over the last tw nearly 20 years uh, has been um, more markets being opened up and more opportunities being there for those of us uh, who, who depend so crucially on um, trade-led growth. Uh, and by that, I include most of the uh, uh, developing and least developed economies in our own um, region. So enforceable rules, markets becoming increasingly open, and essentially a social license that supported domestically, that there was domestic support for trade policy. And that golden weather underpinned by those three very important assumptions carried us through at least until uh, very recently. Unfortunately, over the last four years, uh, that golden weather has effectively ended. We no longer have a functioning dispute settlement mechanism at the World Trade Organization. Uh, markets are not becoming more open. The reality is we have seen the sharpest spike in protectionist measures by a number of economies, and I'm sorry to say it, many developed economies in particular, uh, with very significant impacts for developing and least developed uh, economies. And the social license for trade too has become increasingly frayed in many countries. Uh, and I do think too that the, co the impact of COVID-19 has raised further skepticism about trade policy and whether the food that we are eating, the clothes that we are wearing, the products that we are using, whether those are genuinely safe anymore um, from the challenges imposed on us by COVID. So those are my broader contextual comments. I think the, th the big theme for 2021, my second set of remarks, is around uncertainty. Clearly, we don't know enough yet about the impact, the health impact of COVID-19, nor do we know enough yet shock the depth and breadth. We know that it is going to be significant. Indeed, it already is, as you heard from the earlier presentation, in terms of a range of economic indicators, uh, there are some profound effects uh, that we are now starting to see. And I, as an economist, always think of lag effects as well. So there is a, an ongoing challenge uh, there. And as I said earlier, there's growing uncertainty about the role of trade uh, in fighting uh, the crisis. It is in that context that I now want to move to the mitigation point, uh, my third area uh, for my remarks, which are essentially in two parts. First, I wanted to give you a sense of the trade recovery strategy of a small distant economy, an agricultural dependent economy, namely New Zealand. We launched uh, the, trade the New Zealand trade recovery strategy um, in September last year in response to the COVID-19 crisis. And it is in three parts. We call them the three R's. First of all, retooling, the first R, uh, retooling exporters. That is where we acknowledge that many exporters are no longer able to travel. They can't work with their clients. They're also facing new barriers out there. So we looked to reconfigure the way in which the New Zealand Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade and other domestic agencies uh, with an interest in international economic development uh, were working. In particular, we looked to support and to lean in to support our exporters internationally helping them by making our embassies more available, those embassies offshore, to help them meet clients, for example, to help them break down barriers, to give them market intelligence, and to make that available. And, and I should say that is, of course, available even to non-New Zealanders because it is on the internet on the mfat.govt.nz 
uh, forward slash market intelligence. Um, if you click on that link, uh, you will see over 100 reports produced by New Zealand embassies about market conditions in particular uh, economies around the world. That was the first R. The second R is refreshing the trade architecture because it is a fundamental belief of New Zealanders that, of the New Zealand government, that trade and openness is the way to deal with this pandemic. So in a time of a global crisis, there should be more global cooperation, including in trade, not protectionist measures that uh, beggar and indeed sicken your, your neighbor. So in particular, we have a focus on the World Trade Organization, trying to support and sustain that important institution. Also then to help support the free trade agreements that are emerging in our region. We're a proud member of the CPTPP. We're also a member, as has just been said by the Executive Secretary, of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement signed uh, at the end of um, uh, last year, digitally, by the way. These agreements are fundamentally important stepping stones and building blocks for the regional architecture across the Asia Pacific. In addition to that, New Zealand has a strategy of what we are calling concerted open plurilateralism. This is the idea that we move ahead with small groups of economies that we want to work together with that share our ambition and our objectives, but that we then, when we have concluded that negotiation, we make that agreement open to all other WTO members who uh, are able to meet the standards that we have set. So to give you two practical examples of recent negotiations, the first is the Digital Economic Partnership Agreement, uh, recently signed and now entered into force between Singapore, Chile and New Zealand. Uh, that is about digital trade, about facilitating digital trade. And we've warmly welcomed the interest of Canada in joining that agreement, which was announced at the end of last year. Another important Again, an agreement that we negotiate first, but then um, that we negotiate and then that we look to open up to other uh, economies is the agreement on climate change, trade and sustainability. It's called ACTS for short, the agreement on climate change, trade and sustainability. This is an agreement that will eliminate tariffs on environmental goods and services, but also subsidies. In other words, using trade agreements, hard trade rules, and their enforceability to drive uh, subsidy reform uh, of the kind that really affects many of the economies uh, in this region. It's being negotiated with Costa Rica, with Fiji, New Zealand, Iceland and Norway, as well as Switzerland. And we hope to have this agreement concluded in time for uh, the COP at the end of, um, at the, end of the, the, the UK hosted um, uh, COP. And we welcome um, the interests of other WTO members who may want to join that agreement. But these are our attempts to build, support and sustain the international trade architecture, but also to facilitate cooperation amongst us. My, the final element of our trade recovery strategy is about uh, relationships, the third R. And the relationships are all about our ministers and senior officials getting onto uh, Zoom, Zoom diplomacy, we're calling it, um, and re-engaging with their counterparts. So even though they may not be able to travel, they are at least their colleagues. My final area that I wanted to touch on very briefly is of course APEC. New Zealand has the privilege and the responsibility to be hosting APEC this year. It will all be hosted virtually, so in this kind of format. But in particular, we have the very weighty responsibility to convert the very good work done by Malaysia and the other 19 APEC economies to create the Putrajaya vision, uh, and we will need to convert that vision into the APEC action plan, which will be the agenda that we set for the next 20 years. This will be the primary objective of APEX, of New Zealand's APEC hosting in 2021. But we have other initiatives that we are seeking to advance. We would like, for example, to agree a list, an updated list of environmental goods and services as a contribution to sustainability. We are exploring what areas we might collectively work on the 21 economies on uh, in terms of digital trade. And of course, we want to work together in the various economic and financial fora that APEC provides to address the COVID crisis that we all face, the economic uh, crisis. And in that regard, we would like to be able to identify a list of essential COVID-19 goods, 
gowns, masks, and so on, and to agree amongst uh, APEC economies that we should be facilitating, not restricting the trade in these critical items. By way of conclusion, uh, let me just say, clearly these are uncertain times, these are challenging times for health reasons that we all know, for economic reasons that are well understood, but also the rising, and I'm very sorry to say this, the rising protectionism that we see uh, internationally, including most recently, of course, uh, the imposition of export restrictions on, um, on vaccines that I'm sure uh, is a, um, a striking development. Um, the, the, the other observation that I would make is that I think we can all acknowledge, and as the previous presenter has pointed out, how important trade is to international cooperation and collaboration, but also as a driver of our economic recovery. So I think we need to work across all of the elements that the trade sphere provides to help build our, our shared resilience, but also to drive forward collectively uh, to uh, the greater cooperation uh, that we need to have and the way in which trade can contribute to that greater understanding amongst all of us. For us, of course, it will be about APEC, it will be about the World Trade Organization, but it will also be about important fora such as this one, which it has been my honor uh, and privilege to speak to today. My thanks. I thank Mr. Vitalis for his inspiring address. Distinguished delegates, as the chair of the sixth session of the Committee on Trade and Investment was not available to attend this session, the Secretariat will preside over the election of officers. I now invite Ms. Mia Mikic, Director of the Trade, Investment and Innovation Division of ESCAP, to conduct the election of the Bureau of the Committee. Thank you, Mark. Uh, before I invite delegations to elect the Bureau, some quick reminders for those joining us via e-conferencing platform CUDA. To request for the floor, kindly click on the Request to Speak button. When your request is accepted by the Secretariat and you are called upon to take the floor, kindly click the mic on and camera on buttons on the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Kindly release mic when you have completed your intervention. The Secretariat will be monitoring the messaging function in CUDA, the icon for which is on the right-hand side bar. However, all substantive questions or interventions should be raised through your delegation by using the request to speak button only. For technical issues related to CUDA, you may reach out to the operator by clicking on the operator's tab under the messaging icon and typing your message there. To select the preferred UN language, the drop-down menu is available on the, left, on the lower left of your screen. And finally, to prevent echoes and interference, please ensure all other devices connected to CUDA in the same room are turned off. We'll now proceed with the election of the Bureau. According to the rules of procedure of ESCAP, the Committee on Trade and Investment will be invited to elect a chair and two vice chairs from among its members. I now invite nominations from the floor. I see a uh, Russian uh, Federation asking for the floor. Uh, uh, Mr. Oleg Shamanov, you have the floor, sir. Добрый день тем, у кого день. Предлагается в состав бюро сессии комитета следующие кандидатуры. Его превосходительство господин Вангелис Виталис, замсекретаря торговли Министерства иностранных дел и торговли. Заместитель секретаря Министерства иностранных дел и торговли Новой Зеландии. А в качестве заместителя председателя предлагается Тимур Амарсана. 
чрезвычайный полномочный посол и постоянный представитель Монголии при Исхаде. И его превосходительство Рахмат Будиман, чрезвычайный полномочный посол и постоянный представитель Индонезии в Исхаде. Благодарю вас. Um, I thank the distinguished delegation um, from uh, the Russian Federation for this nomination. Are there any other nominations? As I see none, uh, does any delegation wish to second the nomination made by the Russian Federation? I recognize the distinguished delegation from Pakistan. Sir, you have the floor. Thank you very much uh, for giving me the floor. Uh, good morning, distinguished delegates, uh, dear colleagues and friends. My delegation would like to second the names uh, proposed by the distinguished delegate from the Russian Federation uh, for the chair and vice chairs of the seventh session of the Committee on Trade and Investment. And hope that with their skills and acumen, they will steer the deliberations of the committee to a productive end. Thank you. I thank the distinguished delegate from the Pakistan um, delegation. Um, are there any other delegation wishing to take the floor? As I see none, I have the pleasure to announce that the following officials have been elected as the Bureau of the seventh session of the Committee on Trade and Investment. For the chair, Mr. Vangelis Vitalis, Deputy Secretary, Trade and Economic Group, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Government of New Zealand, and EPEC 2021 Senior Officials Meeting Chair. For the Vice Chairs, His Excellency, Mr. Tumor Amarsana, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary, and Permanent Representative to ESCAP, Embassy of Mongolia, and his Excellency, Mr. Rachman Budiman, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary and Permanent Representative to ESCAP, Republic of Indonesia. I congratulate the Bureau for this election and I hand over the floor to the Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Excellencies, Distinguished Delegates. Um, you have done me a great uh, honour, and if I may say so, it's a real privilege for me now to assume my duties as the chair of the seventh session of this important committee on trade and investment. So, for my uh, on my part and on behalf of um, my my colleagues on on the bureau, let me express my appreciation to um, those delegates who 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 just recently nominated me, but also to all of you for the confidence that you have placed in us uh, collectively in terms of taking our uh, shared agenda forward. Um, as has been the practice in previous committee sessions um, since uh, this unfortunate outbreak of the pandemic uh, and the shift to a virtual uh, session, I'm going to ask the two vice chairs to take over the conduct of this session since they are able to attend um, in person, which unfortunately I am not. Um, I'm confident that they will ensure that uh, this meeting achieves its objectives and of course uh, reaches, as always, a successful conclusion. Um, for this, um, the Bureau, uh, all of us, will rely on your cooperation, uh, distinguished colleagues, uh, and of course the able support, as always, of the, uh, of the Secretariat. Um, the issues to be discussed, of course, today are many and varied, um, but let me now proceed uh, with our first order of business, which is uh, Agenda Item 1C, which is, of course, the adoption uh, of the agenda. So let me, um, this has been presented to you in the annotated provisional agenda document, SCAP forward slash CTI uh, forward slash 2021 uh, forward slash L.1. Uh, now I would welcome comments uh, from the floor, please. Distinguished delegates, I don't see any requests for the floor. The 
Terry will, of course, correct me if I have this wrong, um, but I think we can safely assume that the agenda as contained in document SCAP forward slash CTI slash 2021 forward slash L1 is now um, adopted. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, if I may now, I would like to sort of formally hand over the conduct of this section of this um, of this session to the vice chair, uh, His Excellency Mr. Tomur uh, Marsana, uh, the ambassador uh, extraordinary and plenipotentiary and permanent representative to ESCAP uh, of Mongolia. Please, sir. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Excellencies, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. Since this is the first time that I'm speaking, I wish to thank all delegations for having elected me as a vice chair. Before taking up the next agenda item, the Secretariat wished to make the announcement. I would like to ask Ms. Mikic, please take the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairperson. Distinguished delegates, the seventh session of Committee on Trade and Investment is organized as a virtual meeting to ensure the safety and well-being of all delegates during the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as due to ongoing travel restrictions in many countries in the Asia-Pacific region. While we have some of the Bureau joining the session physically here at the ESCAP uh, Hall, the delegates are joining us through the e-conferencing platform KUDO or via YouTube. Under the circumstances, this session of the committee has been condensed to one three-hour session per day over three days, which is roughly half the amount of time we usually have for our committee sessions. We therefore kindly request for your support as we move forward with the agenda to tailor your interventions to issues for discussion or action only and to keep your interventions to no more than three minutes. The Secretariat will assist the Chair in keeping time. A timer will be displayed on the screen which will count down the three minutes and you will also be alerted when your three minutes are up and will be asked to wrap up your intervention immediately. Thank you for accommodating this request so that we can give as many countries as possible the opportunity to speak. Regarding the report for the seventh session, only key recommendations or decisions made during the session will be captured in the report to be considered for adoption on the final day of this committee session. A summary of proceedings will be captured separately in a chair's summary to be made available after the committee session and annexed to the report. I also wish to bring to your attention that any formal delegation needs to submit an official letter of accreditation from their seat of government, which is normally the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Delegation members who have not yet submitted such a letter are kindly requested to arrange this letter to be sent before the closing of the committee. Finally, the Secretariat wishes to request all delegations to complete the online evaluation survey upon closing of the session. The link to the online survey is available on the committee webpage. The results will be used to improve future sessions of the Committee on Trade and Investment. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Ms. Mijemikic, for this information. As stated by Ms. Mijemikic, given a compressed schedule for this meeting, we ask for your support to tailor your interventions mainly to issues for discussions or actions only, and to keep your interventions to no more than three minutes. And given the technical limitations for conducting the committee through which your platform and in view of the mandates and operational requirements of the committee, priority will be given to the members, associate members, and permanent observers of the commission. Limited opportunities for the interventions will be available for the observer organizations, intergovernmental organizations, and other entities depending on availability of time. 
We shall now commence in our sessions on agenda item two, which is recent trends and developments in trade and investment in Asia and the Pacific, including the impact of rising protectionism and the coronavirus disease pandemic. For this item, you should have before you document SCAP slash CTI slash 2021 slash one rev one. I have now the pleasure to invite Mr. Jan Duval, Chief Trade Policy and Facilitation Section of the Trade Investment and Innovation Division of ESCAP to make presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Let me proceed with some introduction of uh, the agenda item two. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. So despite facing a sharp decline in uh, merchandise trade, Asia and the Pacific has performed better than the rest of the world during 2020, uh, with ESCAP's estimates showing a lower export and import value contraction of 9.7% and 10.3% respectively, while global trade value declined by 14.5%. As a result, the region's prominence in global merchandise trade is expected to rise to an all-time high. 41.8% of the world's exports and 38% 38 38 of global imports are expected to come to or from the Asia-Pacific region. However, uh, excluding China, uh, developing economies will be hit the hardest by the current pandemic. Their exports and imports are expected to decline uh, about 60% and 17% compared with 10% and 9% for developed ones respectively. The poorer trade performance of developing economies is closely linked with their weak ability to implement fiscal and monetary measures, weak domestic growth, and limited capacity to adapt to the new normal, right? like digitally enabled trade. So the COVID-19 crisis impact on trade in services have been even worse than for uh, trade in, uh, in merchandise. Commercial services trade in Asia and the Pacific perform worse than the global level, with export and import declines of more than 22%, and the share of the recent share in global commercial services trade falling from 2019. Next slide, please. So turning to foreign direct investment, right? the region's share in both global uh, inward and outward investment contracted in 2019, in line with the global slowdown in FDI flows. As highlighted in the figure, inward FDI dropped to 35% of world inward FDI in 2019. The largest contractions were in developed countries of the region, which saw a 22% decline, while inflows to developing countries of the region marginally decreased. The region's share in global outward FDI also declined, but the region remains the largest source of outward foreign direct investment. Importantly, much of the outward for direct investment flows are directed to intra-regional destinations. So if we look at greenfield investments uh, in particular, uh, we can get a sense of the impact that the pandemic has had on investment levels uh, in 2020. So the value of announced greenfield projects in the region actually dropped by 40% uh, in 2020 from the average over the same period in 2019. Lockdown measures, including the physical closure of businesses, manufacturing plants, and construction sites were responsible for delayed and cancelled investment projects in 2020. As the pandemic continues to unfold, investment is expected to remain below pre-crisis level in 2021, especially since a number of countries have implemented more restrictive investment policy measures. Next slide, please. Looking ahead, Trade volumes are expected to moderately rebound in 2021, globally by 7.2% in real term, and in Asia and the Pacific by 5.8% and 6.2% in terms of real exports and real imports, right, respectively. So the moderate trade growth will not be sufficient to bring trade volume back to pre-pandemic level. Over the medium to long term, two main trends will affect trade global value chains restructuring, and the digitalization of the global economy. So fast forwarded digitalization will uh, redefine the nature of trade, of traded goods and services. New opportunities will be open to some economies that made themselves ready for digital and global value chain transformation. 
Generally, investment destinations and suppliers that are near and well integrated with large markets, as well as having a relatively competitive labor, uh, labor force, uh, market solid, uh, so, solid transport and digital tra infrastructures, and supportive policy eco ecosystem that facilitate cross-border digital trade will do well. Next slide, please. The pandemic has emphasized the importance of international and regional cooperation and the needs to ensure that trade openness and supply chain connectivity on essential goods, especially medical supplies. Many economies in the region have reaffirmed their commitment to refraining from the imposition of export controls or tariffs and non-tariff barriers and of removing any existing trade restrictive measures on essential goods, especially medical supplies during the COVID-19 crisis. So the region continues to be the largest contributor to the worldwide buildup of preferential trade agreements, uh, with 184 trade agreements in force with at least one party from the region. So the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership that was already mentioned, ASEP signed on 15 November 2020, marks a major achievement uh, with the 15 economies in this agreement accounting for about 30% of uh, global GDP and, and population. Another major development seen in uh, PTAs, in preferential trade agreement, is the increased focus on digital trade issues, which have become even more important during the COVID-19 crisis, as mentioned. Next slide, please. So in that context, a number of issues for consideration and recommendation are proposed related to making trade and investment more sustainable and to capture new opportunities by digital trade. Next slide, please. So trade and investment uh, will be critical to lowering poverty, empowering the poor, and igniting sustainable economic growth in the post-COVID era. So it is proposed that the committee uh, recognizes the role of trade and investment in coping with and recovering from the COVID-19 pandemic and recommends that countries keep borders and markets open with due regard to, for considerations related to protecting public health. It is also proposed that the committee recommends that the Secretariat continues its activities in trade and investment to promote regional cooperation with regard to achieving the targets of the 2030 agenda, including by enhancing the mechanisms established by the member states, such as the Asia-Pacific Trade Agreements and other regional trade and economic partnerships agreements, taking into account, in particular, the needs of countries with special needs. Next slide, please. Trade and investment on the issue of digital trade, ensuring that the gains from digitalization can be realized requires addressing significant gaps in soft infrastructure and building capacity of policymakers, regulators, and negotiators on digital trade related issues. Therefore, it is proposed that the committee recognizes that the growing importance of digital trade and the need for member states to enhance collaboration on, when appropriate, reducing trade barriers to goods and services, underpinning digital trade, and harmonizing rules and regulations affecting digital trade. It is further proposed that the committee promotes leveraging, to the extent possible, existing standards, international frameworks, and initiatives, including the Framework Agreement on Facilitation of Cross-Border Paperless Trade in Asia and the Pacific at ESCAP. Finally, it is uh, also proposed that uh, the committee requests the Secretariat to deepen its analysis of existing rules and regulations in this area in collaboration with other relevant organizations with a view to identifying good practices. Next slide, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tuvo. Uh, the floor is now open for comments. To maintain order and for delegations to be ready to take the floor, when I call on the speaker, I will also announce the delegations next in line. So now the floor is open for the comments.
May I now invite the distinguished delegate from Pakistan and to be followed by China. The Pakistan floor is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It gives me immense pleasure to be part of the seventh session of uh, the Committee on Trade and Investment of UNESCAP. It is indeed uh, an opportunity for all of us to discuss and deliberate on the issues which are crucial for promotion of trade and investment in the region. Uh, first of all, let me acknowledge the efforts of UNESCAP that has always been uh, pivotal in not only in bolstering economic and social uplift in Asia and Pacific region, but also in promoting cooperation among countries to achieve uh, inclusive and sustainable development. Pakistan fully endorses UNESCO's objective and sustainable economic and social development agenda in the region through implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. Ladies and gentlemen, the COVID-19 pandemic shock to the global economy has simultaneously brought the best out of us in terms of resilience. It also exposed the vulnerabilities of the global trading system in value chains. It has again proven that the best way forward does not lie in looking inward, in sourcing or insuring, but in expanding linkages, strengthening partnerships and multilateral cooperation. It has expedited an irreversible digital revolution. The potential of digital platforms and digital trade in augmenting the business activities around the globe has now been practically tested and proven. In the wake of momentous growth of digitization of social and economic activities, the global community now needs to focus on development of harmonized governing rules and regulations. The pandemic has also underlined the need to develop consensus and adoption of principles determining the multilateral trade relations for goods and services in special circumstances as an agreement on the principle which will ensure equitable access of all partners to the resources and dividends. We need collaborative efforts to ensure the trade and investment can help in realizing sustainable development in the Asia Pacific region. At the end, I would like to take this opportunity to once again reiterate that we need to work together for promotion of regional cooperation to trade and investment activities, not only to recover quickly from the shocks of COVID-19, but also to accelerate the achievement of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Pakistan has and will always be a great advocate of promotion of sustainable development through collaboration and cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pakistan. Now, a uh, distinguished delegate from China followed, to be followed by Sri Lanka. Floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Chair, for giving me the floor. Um, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, thank you. And also, uh, thank you, Yan, for the presentation on the report. Uh, ever since the outbreak of the pandemic, China has been actively uh, working with other countries to join to address the challenges brought by the pandemic and to build a community of a common health for mankind. Uh, China has continuously provided gratis assistance to many countries and has always kept the door open for overseas purchases of materials necessary to fight against the pandemic. In addition, China has jointly issued papers and statements with many countries to strengthen cooperation to fight against COVID-19 under a series of bilateral, regional, and sub-regional mechanisms, such as APEC, G20, and ASEAN China Free Trade Areas, etc., to encourage as many as possible countries to eliminate unnecessary trade restrictions, safeguard regional supply chains, so as to promote regional economic recovery at an early date. Um, uh, domestically, China has taken a series of measures to stabilize foreign trade, uh, such as uh, releasing policies to help foreign trade enterprises to resume production, 
encouraging SMEs to participate in foreign trade through e-commerce and transferring export goods to domestic market. Uh, last year, China successfully held the third China International Import Expo, continuing to open up our market to all countries in the world. Um, through the, all the efforts, China's total import and export volume of the year 2020 reached uh, 4.65 trillion US dollars, up by 1.5 percent year on year. And China's uh, actual applicable foreign investment of 2020 reached uh, 144 uh, US, billion US dollars nationwide, uh, an increase of 4.5 percent year on year. Besides, uh, China's GDP has also realized a positive growth of 2.3 percent, despite the uh, negative uh, impact of the pandemic. Uh, as the pandemic has not come to an end, all countries need to work together to address the challenges ahead of us. Therefore, China encourages all countries to continue to support multilateral trading system. Uh, deepen cooperation and bilateral and regional free trade agreements, especially for the just signed RCEP. Uh, we call on all RCEP members to expedite the domestic ratification procedures to promote uh, its early entry into force so as to further enhance regional trade and uh, investment liberalization and facilitation. Um, uh, going forward, China will continue to uh, deepen reform and further open up our markets to the world, continue to liberalize and facilitate trade and investment in an innovative approach, and set up a new pattern for development. China will work with all member states to contribute to the regional and global economic recovery and development. Thank you. Thank you very much, you. distinguished delegate from China. May I now invite the distinguished delegate from Sri Lanka to be followed by Japan. Sri Lanka, please take the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Distinguished delegates, on behalf of the government of Sri Lanka, I congratulate the chair and the bureau and wish to convey best wishes for a successful session at this very challenging time. While noting the significant downward trend in global and regional trade in goods, commercial services, foreign direct investments, travel and tourism sectors, Sri Lanka appreciates the continuous efforts by the UNSCAP in bringing the countries in the region to one platform to enhance regional cooperation towards trade and investment rebound. As a country which has a strong social protection system in South Asia, since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, the government of Sri Lanka has been focusing on emergency health and economic measures, including several economic relief measures uh, for the poorer segments of society and the most vulnerable sectors of business. Despite the challenges encountered with increased expenditure in health sector, Sri Lanka has also been taking measures to enhance economic activities for speedy recovery of trade, investment, and tourism sectors. Revision of taxes, allocating a 50 billion rupee refinancing facility to support business, debt moratorium and, uh, for interest, and uh, capital to all eligible sectors impacted by the economic recession, granting working capital loans and investment purpose loans are among these resilient activities. In the long term, Vistas of Prosperity and Splendor, the national policy framework of the government of President Gotabe Rajapaksha, recognizes the importance of developing strong trade relationships with Asian countries. With its uh, strategic location in the Indian Ocean, Sri Lanka is accelerating work in becoming a logistic and trade hub. And Sri Lanka is also opening doors to many logistical services with its plan of making Karambo the center for global commercial and financial hub for national, regional, and global level investors. Taking another step for the revival of pandemic hit tourism, on 21st of January this year, Sri Lanka joined the very few countries in the world that opened its borders to foreign travelers. Sri Lanka opens the country for tourists under the safe and secure bubble concept 
and it is hoped that this will lead to a significant recovery in the tourism sector in 2021. As suggested in the recommendations under Agenda Item 2, Sri Lanka also believes that the future trade agreements should include provisions to increase coordination and minimize disruption in trade and supply chains in times of crisis or pandemics. Sri Lanka wishes to reconfirm its continuous support in promoting regional cooperation on trade and investment to build back better and accelerate actions to promote the 2030 Agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, distinguished delegate from Sri Lanka. May I invite the distinguished delegate from Japan to be followed by Russian Federation. Please take the floor. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, everyone. First of all, I would like to congratulate SCAP Secretariat and uh, Ms. Miyamike, Director Trade, Investment and Innovation Division and her team on holding this committee despite the challenging situation by COVID-19. As protectionist sentiments spread worldwide, Japan has made the utmost effort to expand the free and fair economic area by vigorously pursuing economic partnership agreement, EPAs, including TPP-11, CT, uh, CTTPP, the Japan-EU and Japan-UK EPAs, and Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, RCEP, which was signed last November. As the chair of the TPP Commission this year, Japan remains committed to expanding free, fair, and modern trade practices in the 21st century and the investment rules in the Asia Pacific region. And we'll take the lead in discussion on free trade, inclusive growth, and sustainable development through multilateral fora, such as ESCAP, APEC, OECD, and other international bodies. In addition, Japan US digital trade agreement, which entered into force in January 2020, demonstrates high standards rules in the area of digital trade, which is expected to grow exponentially in data-driven global economy. This agreement, I believe, will be foundation on which Japan will play a leading role with the United States in formulating rules for digital trade. In the context of rule-based promotion of trade and investment in the Asia Pacific, we should continue to emphasize the importance of W. TO, which is the basis of multilateral trading system. Taking the lesson learned from COVID-19, Japan sees the necessity of rulemaking for export prohibition and restriction at WTO in preparation for any future pandemic. WTO reform, including progress of negotiation on trade-related aspects of electro electronic commerce, needs to be accelerated. Looking toward the 12th WTO Ministerial Conference scheduled this year, Japan is committed to WTO reform hand in hand in stakeholder in the Asia Pacific. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, the distinguished delegate from Japan. May I now invite the distinguished delegate from Russian Federation to be followed by Australia. Russian Federation, please take the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, participants. Uh, uh, thank you for giving me the floor. And with your permission, I'll switch to Russian. В этом году сессия комитета проходит не простых условиях продолжающейся пандемии COVID-19. Она влияет не только на глобальную торговую инвестиционную конъюнктуру, но и на нашу повседневную жизнь. В этой связи хотелось бы выразить благодарность секретариату ИСКАТа за возможность принять участие в сессии в онлайн формате. Благодарим секретариат за представленный доклад, находим его полезным для понимания последних торгово-инвестиционных трендов в Азиатско-Тихоокеанском регионе. С удовольствием отмечаем, что сокращение объемов торговли и прямых иностранных инвестиций в регионе по итогам 2020 года прогнозируется менее резким в сравнении с другими регионами. 
Вместе с тем обеспокоены неравномерным восстановлением, уровнем восстановления экономики стран региона и растущим протекционизмом. В рамках своих антикризисных политик страны вводили новые ограничения, осложняющие доступ товаров, услуг и инвестиций на рынке и нарушающие сложившиеся цепочки добавленной стоимости. Считаем, что все чрезвычайные меры торговой и инвестиционной политики, вводимые в связи с пандемией, должны быть точечными, пропорциональными, прозрачными, временными и не противоречить нормам ВТО. В этой связи хотели бы еще раз подчеркнуть тезис, который не устаем повторять на всех международных площадках. Борьба с пандемией не должна использоваться как предлог для введения новых торговых барьеров, но должна служить стимулом для укрепления торгово-инвестиционного сотрудничества. Особое значение сейчас имеет обеспечение всеобщего доступа к медицинским товарам, в том числе к вакцинам. Информируем, что Российская Федерация уже наладила поставки первой в мире зарегистрированной вакцины «Спутник Ви», а также в январе этого года успешно запустила кампанию по добровольной бесплатной вакцинации российских граждан. Уверена, что такой подход позволит рассчитывать на постепенное ослабление существующих из-за пандемии ограничительных мер, прямо или косвенно ограничивающих торговлю инвестиций. Также ускорившаяся в связи с пандемией цифровизация способна создать новые экономические возможности, в том числе в сфере торговли и инвестиций. Отмечаем необходимость активизации усилий по сокращению цифровых разрывов в развивающихся странах региона, наращивание инвестиций в цифровую инфраструктуру и цифровые навыки людей и компаний, особенно тех, кто проживает и ведет бизнес в удаленных и сельских территориях. Вместе с тем подчеркиваем важность соблюдения принципов технологической нейтральности и цифрового суверенитета, а также защиты персональных данных в ходе выработки международных правил в этой области. Успех в борьбе с последствиями пандемии зависит во многом от согласованности, в том числе на региональном уровне. Так, на уровне Евразийского экономического союза был принят комплекс совместных мер, направленных на поддержание макроэкономической стабильности, обеспечение потребностей населения, поддержание взаимной торговли, свободы перемещения товаров и создание условий для будущего экономического роста в странах ЕС. Считаем, что в условиях нарастающего протекционизма и экономического национализма региональные интеграционные объединения будут способствовать сдерживанию этих тенденций. В том числе с пониманием этого тренда продолжаем наращивать межрегиональное сотрудничество, успешным примером которого является программа между ЕАЭС и АСЕАН 2025 года. Подписание в конце 2020 года соглашения о всеобъемлющем региональном экономическом партнерстве также является интересным примером согласованности стран региона. Мы продолжим наблюдать за развитием событий вокруг соглашения. Уважаемый господин председатель, в рамках обсуждения стратегии кризисного реагирования и восстановления после кризиса считаем важным широкий обмен национальным опытом. Меры противодействия коронавирусной инфекции, принятые правительством Российской Федерации, были в первую очередь направлены на поддержку населения и предприятий в наиболее пострадавших отраслях, прежде всего малых и средних предприятий. На долгосрочную перспективу правительством приняты стратегические национальные цели и подготовлен единый план по их достижению. В ближайшие три года из государственного бюджета на их реализацию планируется потратить более 550 миллиардов долларов США. В завершение хотели бы вновь подчеркнуть, что только коллективными усилиями можно переломить негативные тенденции, с которыми сталкиваются все страны СКАД и выйти на путь устойчивого развития. Готовы активно работать со всеми партнерами во имя достижения этих целей. Спасибо за внимание. Uh, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Please go ahead. Yes, we can hear you.
Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we, we yes we hear. You. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'd like to uh, acknowledge and and um, congratulate the bureau, and I'd like to acknowledge the work of SCAP in this important important area of trade and investment. From Australia's perspective, the multilateral trading system, underpinned by the World Trade Organization, has a crucial role to play in the global response to the pandemic by maintaining open markets and keeping trade flowing. The pandemic represents an enormous challenge for all of us, but it also presents an opportunity. Especially, it is, it is especially important for SCAP to support governments in this region to take concrete actions uh, to lay the foundation for an inclusive, sustainable, long-term recovery from the pandemic. There is a false narrative that reliance on trade equals vulnerability and greater self-sufficiency -sufficien is needed. Instead, we need to recall for ourselves and explain to our communities the benefits of trade and the contribution of the WTO and the multilateral trading system to our collective prosperity and the impact, it, the positive impact it has in terms of open markets and lifting millions of people out of poverty and promoting growth, while also acknowledging the importance of WTO reform to ensure the organisation remains fit for purpose. To this end, Australia has taken every opportunity to join, to join with other UN members to signal our ongoing support for the rules-based multilateral trading system. This is reflected in the International Trade and Development Resolution adopted during the 75th session of the UN General Assembly, and also in Australia joining 174 other UN members to issue a statement on the importance of open markets, the flow of essential goods and supply chain connectivity. Uh, Mr. Chairman, when it comes to free trade agreements, Australia, of course, uh, welcomes uh, recent signature of RCEP, uh, of which Australia is a member. And we also place a lot of value in CPTPP. These agreements uh, strengthen the economic architecture of our region uh, and set the norms for trade and eco economic engagement in our region. Finally, Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to touch on the importance of development cooperation in supporting a growth agenda. Australia's new development policy, Partnerships for Recovery, highlights that trade will play a key role in economic recovery from COVID-19. For example, it highlights that Australia will provide support to partner governments to revitalise export markets and access finance for trade, continue advocacy and support for free trade and open markets to stimulate a shared economic recovery, help the private sector re-establish markets and global value chains and avoid protectionism and work to keep the global trading system open. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, distinguished delegate from Australia. May I now invite the distinguished delegate from Mongolia to be followed by Indonesia. The floor is yours. Mr. Chairperson and distinguished participants, it's an honor and privilege to speak on behalf of Mongolian delegation to the seventh session of the Committee on Trade and Investment. As, a, as a trade in Asia and Pacific continues to grow, the regional countries are pushing for robust trade agreements, including regional comprehensive economic partnership and deeper integration in global supply chains, which continue to drive the economies in the recent decades. Though not all countries and economies have been equal beneficiaries of the growth. Enhancing connectivity and market access continues to be a top priority for Mongolia, the only landlocked nation in the Northeast Asia. Constrained by, the, uh, by their landlocked status, landlocked developing countries such as Mongolia, which heavily rely on the seaports of its neighboring countries for the movement of goods and services to and from international markets 
felt the current pandemic's economic shocks more accurately than in normal circumstances. Mongolia's total foreign trade turnover was down 7%. Uh, uh, or about 900 million less of the same period of the last year. Foreign investment as of the third quarter of 2020 down 297 million from the same period in, nine, in 2019. Echoing the executive secretary, it is not the time to turn inwards to protectionism. We believe that the response to the current crisis is to trade more with the outside world. One of the main motto of the Mongolia's long-term development strategy, Vision 2050, is to aim to export to Mongolia in the midterm. As the Executive Secretary mentioned, Mongolia become the latest member to the Asia-Pacific Trade Agreement, which we believe opening the opportunities for our producers to tap into the market of over 2 billion people and connect them with the sources of their premier technological advances and the regional supply chain. Trade facilitation is an essential soft infrastructure to alleviate the trade constraints caused by remote and landlocked location of Mongolia. This is the reason why Mongolia is aiming at the framework agreement on facilitation of cross-border paperless trade in Asia and the Pacific. The government is in the process of completing internal procedures of accession. Mongolia joined accession ratification accelerator program of the framework agreement last year. We appreciate the Secretariat's technical assistance and advisory services to the government. We estimated that about 30% will be cut from the trade cost after the combined effective implementation of the WTO trade facilitation agreement and framework agreement on the paperless trade. Mongolia urged the fellow ESCAP member countries to consider joining this agreement as it is an important mechanism to promote regional cooperation in trade and investment. Further to enhance our efforts to implement trade facilitation agreement, the government opened its first foreign trade information portal to the public use in December 2020. The government appreciates UNSCAP, especially an office, the Asian office, for the organization of the series of three training workshops on economic corridor management for the government officials as well as other stakeholders. The importance of the workshop was the timing, because it coincides with the government's commitment and efforts to effectively implement Mongolia-Russia-China Economic Corridor Program in line with sustainable development goals. Mongolia commends UNSCAP for the launch of the Online Trade Intelligence Negotiation Advisor, TINA. We believe the online advisor will be useful for Mongolia's negotiation team for its upcoming endeavor to undertake feasibility study on the free trade agreement with Eurasian Economic Union, which includes three more ESCAP member countries. I wish successful outcome of the meeting. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you very much, distinguished delegate from Mongolia. May I now invite distinguished delegate from Indonesia to be followed by Cambodia. Indonesia, please take the floor. Uh, thank you, Chairman, uh, distinguished uh, member delegate. Good day to all of you. It's a great honor to me for me today to lead the Asian delegation. We wish to convey a, of its uh, appreciation to you, uh, His Excellency Ambassador Fenius Vitalis. Our sincere thanks also goes to His Excellency Ambassador Rahmat Budiman of Indonesia for taking up the test as our vice chair. A lot, but at least we would like to convey our gratitude to the ESCAP Secretariat for the present, uh, present document and provide guidance on the future direction of the work of Secretariat in the substantive area of trade investment in the Asia-Pacific region. Mr. Chair and distinguished delegate, I concur with the report that COVID-19 pandemic has undeniably hit uh, our countries with extensive economic consequences. In Indonesia, the pandemic has affected trade and investment in three ways. First, it has reduced our export as global demand has reached its lowest level. Second, it also decreased foreign direct investment as its global capital drives up. Third, it's hardest hit service sector, where a great number of our micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises are highly depending on tourism and travel-related service activities. Indonesia has revoked several export restrictive policies to ensure that any emergency threat measure taken into the context of the pandemic are targeted. Uh, temporary do not create necessary barriers to trade and are consistent with WTO rules. Indonesia remains committed to working together globally and regularly to keep our markets open and render necessary trade facilities, trade facilities measures. 
The government of Indonesia also undertaken steps to facilitate and to strengthen international investment by increasing transparency and predictability of investment policies through simplification and acceleration of investment requirement procedures and to increase international cooperation in investment sector. Furthermore, the COVID-19 outbreak is likely to create unique supply chain challenges through the world. To tackle this prevalent supply chain challenges, Indonesia embraced multi-method solution. The Indonesia government uh, has provided a level playing field and transparency and stability in fiscal and political reform to increase the interactiveness destination for Indonesia foreign investment. First, on the policy side, the government recently reintroduced the omnibus law, which to aim the reduced red tape to eliminate unnecessary bureaucracy. Second, government launched a number of public work projects, which not only seek to upgrade a ailing infrastructure, but also create jobs during the pandemic. Lastly, the Indonesian government continue to boost uh, collaboration with the other country. The degradation of our ship, uh, in which Indonesia is actively involved, will be strong growth driver for the regional value chain. Simultaneously, this effort also could generate interesting opportunities for the ESCAP countries. ESCAP needs to leverage the regional connectivity by building infrastructure to support resilient economic development. To answer this challenge, Indonesia government launched numerous public works projects across the country. This initiative has dual objective. First, to upgrade ailing infrastructure. Second, to create jobs during the pandemic. To meet the gigantic infrastructure development demands, hence it creates the need to tap uh, profit resource through the public-private partnership, mainly to an, in energy for security, railroad, networks, and environment. These efforts are directed to create more connected, resilient, and sustainable supply chain system, especially to overcome the side effect of the COVID-19 pandemic. Indonesia support ESCAP initiative to facilitate the paperless threat in Asia, uh, Asia and Pacific to support the facilitation agreement, implementation, and development across border commerce. Indonesia National Sing Window fulfilled the basic principle of framework agreement of facilitation of cross border paperless threat in Asia Pacific. Uh, such as custom consumption, electronic single windows, and general paperless policy initiative. Indonesia will continue to work closely to extend cooperation with ESCAP and member uh, states in order to have comprehensive view to bring the most benefit of framework agreement. I believe the entry into force or F, uh, framework agreement in February uh, uh, next month will contribute to improve the paperless state in four months. To conclude, I will me to assure member that Indonesia will continue its unwavering support the multilateral trading system under the auspices of the WTO. The world members uh, of the WTO will so bring the multilateral trading system into its new era. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Indonesia, distinguished uh, delegate from Indonesia. And uh, may I now invite the distinguished delegate from Cambodia uh, to be followed by Bangladesh. Please take the floor. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Excellencies, distinguished colleagues. Uh, at the outset, on behalf of the delegation of Cambodia, I would like to echo with the Secretariat note that international trade performance and investment activities, including uh, FDI in Asia and the Pacific region, has been significantly affected by the COVID-19 pandemic and the ongoing trade tensions. In the Secretariat note, Regional merchandise trade, commercial services, and FDI declined in 2019 and 2020. Cambodia has a small export-based economy where trade represents about 40% of the GDP, has also been impacted by the global economic downturn caused by the pandemic. Cambodia's other important source of income, tourism, has also been severely affected all these negative effects have forced the government to roll out major supporting measures to minimize the impacts of the pandemic on social economy conditions of the impacted industries and our people. As rightly point out, pointed out in the note, digital trade and e-commerce has been prominent during this difficult time. Cambodia is also attaching great importance to this sector by passing the e-commerce law in late 2019 and had moved quickly with the implementa implementation of the law, along with e-commerce strategy to accelerate the adoptions of e-commerce in Cambodia. However, with significant gaps still remain in the sector between LDCs and other economies, Cambodia would like to call upon the Secretariat to provide support to smaller economies such as LDCs 
in terms of pragmatic policy development, capacity building, technology transfer and study on the impact of the harmonization of digital trade rules and regulations to effectively participate in e-commerce and digital trade. As these are still limited and unavailable, which require further enhancing and strengthening of capacity. In terms of trade liberalization and investment promotion, although some countries have imposed trade restriction measures in this time of crisis, Cambodia as an LDC has kept our trade and investment liberalized and open to all trading partners without discrimination, as we recognize that trade and investment is crucial for swift economic recovery post-pandemic. We do not have any trade restriction measures or non-tariff measures, as we are always a strong believer in trade liberalization, multilateralism, and rule-based trading system. It is therefore important that all member states should maintain open and liberal, liberal trading regimes so that we can work together to achieve our shared objectives and the SDGs. Through sharing best practices and experience in making trade works in this time of pandemic and recovery plan for post-pandemic. We fully agree that the signing of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership is a good move to the right direction in the region and that we hope that the trade and investment will perform better in the coming years. At the regional level, Cambodia will join hand with uh, ASEAN member states to effectively implement the 12 recommendations under the midterm review of the ASEAN Economic Community Blueprint 2025, especially in the areas of Industrial Revolution 4.0, digital transformation, green energy transition, and human capacity development, etc. I thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, even though we have uh, three minutes uh, of uh, intervention, I would like to ask the speakers to uh, speak slowly, to provide interpreters to fully translate your interventions, please. So may, may I now invite the distinguished delegate from Bangladesh to be followed by India. Bangladesh. Take the floor, please. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, distinguished delegates, and also the vice chairs. At the outset, let me congratulate the UNSCAP Secretariat for preparing a comprehensive paper titled Recent Trends and Development in Trade and Investment in Asia and the Pacific. It rightly pointed out the importance of more regional cooperation in this difficult time when COVID-19 pandemic brought many challenges in the area of trade and investment. I'd like to thank uh, the Executive Secretary as she has rightly pointed out Bangladesh's effort and pioneering role, especially in its uh, ratification uh, uh, of the UN uh, SCAP initiative of uh, the framework, signing the framework agreement of cross-border people's trade. Uh, we look forward to UN SCAP support in future in this regard. At present, Bangladesh uh, is getting support from UN SCAP in uh, its effort to uh, consummating and concluding a comprehensive economic partnership agreement with the support of trade intelligence and negotiation advisor, China developed at the initiative of UNSCAP. I thank SCAP once again. Uh, Bangladesh is going to celebrate 50 years of independence in 2021. During her journey of five decades since independence in 1971, Bangladesh may claim to be a unique achiever of economic development. Bangladesh can genuinely take pride in its track record of economic resilience, entrepreneurship, development, and external sector performance like export trade. I have gone through the paper and heard the, uh, the presentation made by Jan Duval. I thank him. And in the backdrop of uh, the uncertainties is, uh, that is looming large in the global uh, trade scenario, Bangladesh strongly supports UNSCAP proposition that LDCs and graduating LDCs should participate and re-benefit from future agreements and cooperation initiatives 
in trade and investment in Asia and the Pacific region. Uh, Bangladesh uh, Blade has become a very renowned ICT outsourcing countries in the last, uh, during the last 10 years, its achievement is very praiseworthy. So the question uh, that has been uh, mentioned in the paper, I would like to emphasize that Bangladesh solicits cooperation from the countries of this region for creating and enabling ambience for digital trade and digital economy. In this regard, the UNSCAP may undertake some initiatives for introduce, introducing a platform for exchanging and showcasing ideas, prospects, and innovations of the countries of this region. I would humbly request all the countries uh, to try to integrate and uh, form some rules uh, for uh, digital trade and making a good ambience and atmosphere for digital trade. We strongly believe that the cooperation uh, a, a, among the countries of Asia and the Pacific region should be enhanced in relation to digital trade, e-commerce, and we would also uh, face the challenges of uh, Industry 4i. Uh, we are in favor of multilateral trading system, uh, and we want regional, regional uh, integration. Uh, with this, I uh, end my speech, short speech, and I thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, the head of innovation and you know, um, uh, uh, trade and investment. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, dear colleagues. Thank you very much, the distinguished delegate from Bangladesh. May I now invite the distinguished delegate from India to be followed by Georgia. India, please take the floor. India, you are muted. I guess I'm audible now. Yes. Mr. Chair, thank you for the floor. I also take this opportunity to congratulate the chair on assumption of chairmanship of this committee. India has noted the summary of the report, especially the recent trends and developments in merchandise trade commercial services, foreign direct investment, and the loss of global GDP on account of the COVID-19 pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic is a concern for all, especially for the resource deficient developing countries due to its far reaching impact on economic activity and trade in these countries. As the report highlights, the COVID-19 pandemic has further accentuated the inherent weaknesses and inequalities in the global economic and trading system and the urgent need for the restructuring and diversification of global value chains. India notes the committee's observation that the trade restrictive measures such as export restriction implemented by countries in response to the pandemic has been driven primarily by public policy objectives. For instance, in the initial period of the crisis, Using this tool, India was able to ensure equitable access to healthcare products and medicines and could supply to more than 150 countries based on mutually assessed needs. As the largest vaccine producing country of the world, we are fulfilling our commitment to make our vaccine production and delivery capacity available for the benefit of the entire humanity. To this end, more than 6 million doses of COVID-19 vaccine has already been supplied to several countries under India's vaccine Matri initiative. India believes that our combined efforts should be on ensuring availability and accessibility to resources for all, keeping affordability aspect in focus. India reiterates its commitment to ensuring equitable and affordable access to vaccines for all and our vaccines production and delivery capacity will be used in full measure towards this end. There has been significant market diversification in India's trade in recent years, a process that has helped in coping with this sluggish global demand. We are confident that the structural reforms introduced by us in the last few years, with the objective to provide a stable, sustainable, and predictable policy environment for trade in merchandise and services along with host of measures taken after the outbreak of COVID-19 should be should enable the country to bounce back 
on its targeted growth path. India is the fourth biggest export destination for the LDCs. We have notified preferential treatment to services and service suppliers of LDCs. Performance of India's commercial service sector during the COVID-19 crisis reinforced India's position as a valued and trusted partner across the globe. India's IT and ITES industry demonstrated remarkable resilience in responding to the pandemic, ensuring business continuity for all global clients. The IT, ITES industry's efforts were complemented by an enabling ecosystem of robust infrastructure and regulatory changes, which aided the, which aided the industry's adaptation to this crisis. The pandemic crisis underscores the importance facilitating in the importance of facilitating free movement of professionals under mode 4 india's liberalized foreign direct investment policy allows 100% shareholding on the autom automatic route, automatic approval route for most sectors the measures taken by the government on the fronts of fdi policy reforms investment facilitation and ease of doing business have resulted in increased fdi inflows into the country despite the pandemic efforts uh, despite the pandemic effects and the impact, the adverse impact of the pandemic, the FDI equity inflows into the country during the financial year 2020-2021 up to September 2020 has seen remarkable growth of 15% compared to the corresponding period over the last year. We have taken several measures to ease the foreign trade envi environment through further digitization of processes and their simply simplification for businesses. Developing countries and LDCs at this stage need to focus on improving their domestic physical and digital infrastructure and policy and regulatory frameworks so as to bridge the digital divide and enable the benefits of digitization to be equitably shared. The pandemic disruptions reinforced our belief in the, belief in the importance of multilateralism and adherence to a rule-based global order in achieving the larger good in an equitable manner. Finally, the multilateral institutions like the WTO have an important role to play in building mutual trust, in minimizing the impact of disruptions, and ensuring global recovery with efficacy. India firmly believes that multilateral avenues based on consensus are the most effective means to achieve inclusive, de inclusive development-oriented outcomes. I thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, distinguished delegate from India. May I now invite the distinguished delegate from Georgia. Georgia, please take the floor. Seems that Georgia logged out. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I see Georgia. Georgia, please take the floor. Georgia, when you get the floor, please do not click the request to speak button again and just unmute and turn on the camera. You have the floor. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Now, I would like to thank you, ESCAP Secretariat and Committee on, of Trade and Investment for organizing this important meeting. I I would like to mention that the economic policy of government of Georgia is oriented on free, fair, inclusive, and sustainable development. We have already accomplished and continue to 
implement legislative and institutional reforms in order to ensure and guarantee effective public services, open and fair competition on a market proper, uh, proper protection of property and intellectual rights and freedom of access, of, um, access to free judiciary. Reforms have established a liberal, stable, secure and corruption-free business environment in Georgia, along with strategic geographic locations, turn Georgia into an, an attractive country for investing. As a result of targeted trade liberalization efforts, Georgia already has free trade agreement with UK, Turkey, CIS countries, EFTA, uh, China, uh, and uh, uh, deep and comprehensive free trade area agreement with the uh, European Union which covers about uh, 2.5 billion in consumer market. And Georgia also enjoys GS GSP regime from US, Canada, and Japan. Forward development of interconnections, uh, especially in the field of transport, it is of trans strategic importance for Georgia and the region. Georgia is a reliable transit partner and key actor of transport existing commitment committed and to actively participate in the major strategic projects and initiatives. For Georgia as a foreign humanity, the outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic is a big challenge. The COVID-19 uh, COVID pandemic forces government of Georgia to impose strict measures on its citizens as well as on economy to avoid further deterioration of epidemic situation in the country. During the first wave of the pandemic, we managed to significantly limit the number of deaths and infected people. It gave us necessary time to prepare for second wave, bearing, uh, bearing mind in vulnerability of Georgian economy the above containment measures, coupled with the world economic slowdown may have a serious impact on country's economic growth. During the second wave, we are continuing our action to relieve the existing crisis, Government of Georgia reorganized all government services. Main emphasis was on development of e-governance. Government of Georgia increased the number of services which is possible to receive electronically online. However, uh, all uh, uh, further financial enhancement will be necessary to increase response efforts to COVID-19. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, distinguished delegate from Georgia. Now I would like to make uh, ask interventions will be available for the observer organizations, intergovernmental organizations, and other entities if they wish to do so. So please. Take law four, if you wish to, to do so. I see this is not the case. So, so no more delegates who wish to take the floor. Can I take it that the committee generally endorses the findings and recommendations contained in the document for this agenda item and generally agrees with the recommendations as contained in the secretariat presentations? And does the committee wish to make any additional specific decisions or recommendation on any topic under this agenda item? I see now. So with this, we include we conclude the discussion on agenda item two. So, excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, we will now move to agenda item three, promoting inward and outward foreign direct investment in the post-coronavirus disease era. For this item, you should have before you document SCAP slash CTS slash 2021 slash two. I now have the pleasure to invite Mr. Mark Proch, Chief of Investment and Enterprise Development Section, Trade Investment and Innovation Division, of, to introduce this document. The floor is yours.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can I have the next slide? Yes. Next slide, please. Um, distinguished delegates, it is my pleasure to introduce this agenda item based on the uh, relevant document uh, for this agenda item. Uh, repurposing FDI for sustainable development in the COVID-19 context. Um, it is, of course, no secret that the COVID uh, pandemic has had an immediate and severe impact on FDI levels in the region. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, our data in the paper that we distributed show that announced greenfield investment projects dropped by 40% in 2020. And uh, we have actually recently an, uh, an update from, uh, uh, from, from UNCTAD. Um, I want to quote you a few figures from the recent data that came out this week, so they are not in the, in, in the paper. But just to give you an idea, according to UNCTAD, the global FDI has collapsed in 2020, falling by 42% to uh, about 859 billion dollars, compared to 1.5 trillion in 2019. And it finished in 2020 more than 30% below the trough after the global financial crisis in 2009. So it shows uh, the enormity of the, of the drop. The decline was actually concentrated in developed countries, where FDI flows by, by fell by about 69%. But there's, again, good news, uh, also with regard to trade. FDI uh, drop in the region here in Asia Pacific has not been as dramatic. Um, if we compare, for instance, with Latin America and the Caribbean, it dropped 37%. It dropped 18% in Africa, but only 4% in developing Asia, as defined by UNCTAD. And East Asia was the largest host region accounting for one third of global FDI in 2020. So this is just to, to give you a bit of an, of an update. Of course, uh, these data are not uh, contained in the, uh, uh, in, in the paper for consideration. Um, the outlook for FDI beyond 2021 is highly uncertain and depends on the duration of the crisis and the effectiveness of policy interventions and of course the rate at which uh, vaccination can proceed. Um, but of course, while the pandemic has hampered investment, it has also provided governments with a unique window of opportunity to re-examine their approaches to inward and outward investment with a view towards increasing the contribution of FDI to sustainable uh, development. And of course, FDI is an, an, an important source of financing for development, and it can help countries get back on the path towards sustainable development. But in order to do that, bold new actions taken today are necessary, we, which will set the, uh, the national development trajectories for the next decade and, and longer. So in this regard, um, we have considered, uh, we have identified five priority areas for both inward and outward, outward FDI as identified in, in, in the paper, in the document under this agenda item. Uh, for repurposing FDI in the evolving COVID-19 context and recovery period. So, the first is target FDI for the digital economy. Uh, several delegations already highlighted the importance of uh, digital economy, digital trade uh, under the previous session. And of course, uh, it is no different in the area of investment. There are actually two aspects of this. One is to attract FDI to promote digital infrastructure because digitalization requires an, an supporting infrastructure that not all countries uh, have in place. So FDI can help with that. But it is also no secret that future FDI uh, will look at the quality of digital facilities and infrastructure in, in countries and specific locations and sites they want to, uh, to locate. So it's important to build digital competitiveness and also to use digital technologies and services to promote, retain, and reduce barriers to FDI. And this is, I think, uh, of particular importance for investment promotion agencies to uh, use uh, digital tools to uh, continue giving appropriate information to investors because this is really the crucial thing that investors always needed and will continue to need proper, accurate, up-to-date uh, information about possible investment opportunities and the, uh, the qualities of uh, investment sites. 
The next priority is, of course, also very obvious. It is to identify and promote green growth, identify priority green sectors uh, for investment, and ensure that they're open for investment. And uh, investment promotion agencies could be targeting uh, specific FDI promotion in these sectors. Uh, the pandemic has really provided an unparalleled opportunity to create an enduring, inclusive, green and resilient path to recovery. So, of course, it is important to identify uh, the, 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 the problems uh, in, this, in this area and to identify the, 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 the priority green sectors. And that will help them to design and operationalize ambitious uh, uh, green investment policies. Alongside these efforts, green sectors must be further open for investment by reducing restrictions, implementing a clear policy and regulatory frameworks to attract investors, introducing financial mechanisms to attract green investment, and encouraging more environmentally friendly corporate behavior. I think this is an important thing. We all know that there are international, uh, internationally recognized standards of uh, responsible business conduct, uh, which also covers, of course, foreign investors and multinational enterprises. And in the attraction of FDI in the future, I think a very strong criteria should be to what extent investors adopt these, these principles. The third uh, priority area is to support SMEs and value chain linked FDI. That means that extends support to both local and foreign small and medium enterprises and in short also targets SMEs with links to foreign investors. Uh, actually, this is an, an, an issue that has been highlighted for many years, that foreign direct investment can help uh, develop uh, domestic enterprises by providing backward and forward linkages. Uh, that's why we have these global and regional value chains. Um, in actual fact, these chains are not as strong as we want them to be. There is scope for improvement. Um, there's also an increased foreign investment by small and medium enterprises, often following uh, their big, uh, large enterprise they are supplying to uh, abroad. But there is also, of course, an important message for governments to improve the quality of their own domestic SMEs so that they can also become important suppliers to, uh, to foreign investors. So then the fourth priority is to address multi-level uh, governance issues. Um, this is uh, an important aspect of this is the international investment agreements that countries are party to. Already um, many countries are revisiting these agreements. Some have terminated these agreements. Others have uh, implemented or, or developed model treaties for their future negotiations, um, which are not always uh, compatible with the demands of the foreign investors from developed countries. But everybody will agree that there is an, 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 a need to rebalance those agreements, make them more development-oriented. And now with related to COVID-related policy responses, um, there is also a need to, to see to what extent uh, these agreements can be modified to include provisions uh, similar to, to free trade agreements to deal with future pandemics and the disruptions. In particular, uh, measures that countries take uh, in order to respond to the pandemic may violate some of these treaty obligations under such stabili stabi stability stabilization clauses, and they may be they may be challenged by foreign investors uh, in international courts. Well, we want to prevent that, of course. Then, finally, uh, ladies and gentlemen, there is a leverage outward FDI for home country development. We have always emphasized uh, the importance and, and, and contribution of inward foreign direct investment. And there, many countries have a very uh, expensive infrastructure in place to attract, promote, and facilitate inward foreign direct investment. But increasingly, lots of countries, especially in the region, also become uh, uh, the origin of foreign investment abroad. And uh, I think this is, uh, there is not so much empirical evidence in this area. So we have opened a an, an research stream in this area with, with international partners. And uh, we're looking uh, now to develop an, an, a toolkit to help countries uh, use, utilize, promote outward foreign direct investment for their own sustainable development. And of course, uh, we do not want to uh, to, to, to neglect the inward foreign direct investment. So what we are actually trying to, to do is to develop an, an, an online platform 
through existing modalities that we have, like ArtNet on FDI, to bring countries that want to promote outward FDI and countries that, that, that look for inward FDI to, to bring them together to see if, uh, if, we, can, if we can match them. Um, I also want to inform you that uh, some years ago we developed a, a comprehensive handbook uh, on FDI policies, promotion and facilitation for sustainable development. Um, the book has been very popular, but as we all know, things get outdated very quickly. So we are at the moment, we are updating that and see how we can uh, convert that handbook also to an online uh, resource center, uh, which would include uh, concrete training courses in this area. We're doing something similar in the area of SMEs, by the way. Um, where the very strong uh, incentive is uh, to develop SMEs to become partners with foreign investors and for foreign investors to look for uh, SMEs as, as suppliers and other partners in, in developing economies. So with that, uh, I come to the issues for consideration, recommendations. Uh, find the next slide. And next. So, uh, in addition to the Secretary's ongoing work on inward FDI, increased attention should be paid to the role of outward and intra-regional FDI in contributing to and promoting sustainable development. Actually, since we uh, are looking for, for, for this matching platform, which is the second recommendation, the creation of an online platform using existing resources to help channel inter-regional FDI into sustainable development sectors through matching inward and outward investment. And uh, we know that inward uh, intra-regional trade is already uh, higher than 50% of the region's total trade, but inter-regional investment is also higher than 50%, so it's quite, quite considerable. And the Asia-Pacific region is not only the largest uh, destination for inward inf for FDI, but it also uh, has emerged as the largest source of FDI. So I think there is a lot of scope to see how we can promote both outward and inward FDI and to the mutual benefit of all countries in, in the region. And for that, we intend to, to develop an online platform to do that. Since we have already a an, an platform on FDI, this would not require uh, additional resources, which is often a, a concern. Then finally, uh, we all want to promote FDI, not for its own sake. We all want FDI to contribute to sustainable development. But how do we know that it actually does? Um, we have in the past tried to do some studies at national level to develop indicators that help countries develop uh, indicators that will help them measure the contribution of FDI to sustainable development. And it has proved to be challenging. It is not an easy task. We're actually now doing uh, guidelines, we're developing guidelines and templates for indicators which countries can, can use uh, to adapt them to their own national situation and their own national uh, priorities. Because if you don't know what the contribution of FDI to your development is, it is very difficult to target the FDI that you really want and to highlight the priority sectors where you want FDI in. So uh, with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I conclude this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mark Proch. The floor is now open for comments. To maintain order and for delegation to be ready to take the floor, when I call on the speaker, I will also announce the delegation next online. Now the floor is open for intervention. Now I would like to invite the distinguished delegate from Cambodia to be followed by Bangladesh. Cambodia, please take the floor. Uh, I start for uh, working uh, very hard uh, uh, Sorry, we can't hear you. Buddy. Can, can, uh, can we use the headphones or 
volume up. Uh, I would like to give the floor to the next speaker and uh, let's work out with uh, Cambodia and we'll come back to you. Now I would like to take a floor. Bangladesh, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Once again, uh, Bangladesh uh, has been inviting for direct investment in the country since the beginning of her birth. Uh, the investment uh, promotion agencies in Bangladesh are working very hard, and uh, in line with that, uh, there are Uh, in order to facilitate FDI and information uh, and formation of company in Bangladesh, uh, the Ministry of Commerce of Bangladesh has already formulated the Companies Amendment uh, Act 2020, revising the Company Act uh, 1994 in line with the ease of doing business. And we have newly formulated uh, different uh, sort of online platforms to facilitate uh, investment. Uh, with regards to outward investment, uh, uh, Bangladesh uh, uh, is uh, lagging uh, behind, but uh, recently Bangladesh Bank has undertaken a policy to enable Bangladesh uh, to investors to invest abroad as investors of Bangladesh. Good uh, potentials. Any countries um, and world. Uh, Bangladesh Bank and Bangladesh Investment Development Authority have started negotiations and discussions to define general policy for outward foreign investment. Since we have uh, some specific economic targets such as 2021, 2030, 2041, 2071, and Delta Plan of 200, uh, 2100, we aim at increasing investment Massive inward and outward investment will be required for us to attain these targets. Some quick uh, comments on the paper uh, that uh, was presented and that was uh, supplied before the uh, meeting, committee meeting. Uh, Bangladesh uh, highly recognizes uh, and acknowledges the view of uh, Economic and Social Commission that FDI is one of the main engines of growth and development. Oh, the investment uh, scenario in Asia. Uh, pardon? I beg your pardon? Yeah, the investment scenario in Asia and the Pacific will become increasingly uncertain uh, because of the onslaught of COVID-19. Establishing an investment climate will need better and innovative approach in future. It is perceived that from the paper that escape SCAP will uh, come up with some pragmatic policy options of, for simplification of FDI policy and Bangladesh will definitely support and follow that a good support for us in terms of uh, attracting foreign direct investment. As Bangladesh is going to face graduation challenges ahead, we would like to receive policy advice, country-specific FDI sustainability indicators for the FDI. Uh, with this end, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, thank you, distinguished delegates from Bangladesh. Could you send us your written statement that we could distribute to other member states? And now I want to come back to Cambodia. No? Turkey, okay. I could, okay, Cambodia will come back to you later. Now I'd like to ask to take the floor a distinguished delegate from Turkey and to be followed by Russian Federation. Turkey, take the floor, please. Uh, 
Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, distinguished committee members, delegates, and participants. I'd like to ask the Secretariat for organizing this. Hold on. Yeah. I'd like to thank, uh, first of all, the ESCAP Secretariat for organizing this seventh session of the Committee on the Trade and Investment and uh, send our warmest regards from the Turkey's National Investment Promotion Agency, namely Presidency Investment Office. And uh, in line with our today's agenda, I'd like to uh, very briefly give an overview of our strategy towards the inward investment promotion during the COVID-19 outbreak. As we all know, generally speaking, the global foreign direct investment is expected to decline sharply due to the pandemic, and many companies have either canceled or postponed their investments across the world, as there is high degree of uncertainty. Their global supply networks have been significantly disrupted and they are not fit between supply and shocks. But having said that, while we hope the pandemic ends as soon as possible, there are also emerging, emerging opportunities both during and after the pandemic. There are obvious emerging investment opportunities for certain sectors, such as ICT and healthcare, as we all know. But as the global supply chains uh, are disrupted, multinational companies are now looking to diversify and secure their supplier networks through relocation and better management of inventories. Therefore, our multinational companies are reconsidering their geographic and sectoral activities, which may eventually lead to divestments from some locations, but expansion in other locations. We believe the pandemic has just vindicated Turkey's core value proposition as strategic partner with a convenient location between East and West that plays a key role in global value chain which was significantly disrupted by the COVID-19. Our long-term strategy to attract high-value-added investments has not changed, but the pandemic has created an opportunity to highlight Turkey's position as a reliable supplier for the global economy, thanks to the country's competitive advantages, the advanced manufacturing capabilities, convenient location, and international network of free trade agreements. Uh, due to the uh, time constraints, I'd like to finalize my uh, comment statements nearby and wish everyone a free session ahead and thank you once again for the organization. Thank you. Thank you very much, distinguished delegate from Turkey. May I now invite the distinguished delegate from Russian Federation to be followed by Pakistan. Russian Federation, please take the floor. Уважаемый господин председатель, благодарим секретариат за представленный доклад. Кризис, вызванный пандемией, который ударил по без того сокращающимся потоком прямых иностранных инвестиций, сделал еще более нетривиальной задачу стимулирования инвестиционной активности в мире. Принимая во внимание растущий тренд на протекционизм, считаем важным, чтобы применяемые зарубежными партнерами механизмы скрининга иностранных инвесторов и инвестиций соответствовали обязательствам в рамках ВТО. Вместе с тем, к счастью, остается пространство для стимулирования инвестиций. Так, в России с апреля 2020 года начал действовать механизм государственной поддержки инвестиционных проектов в формате соглашения о защите и поощрении капиталовложений, которые заключаются между инвесторами и государством. Кроме того, запущен инвестиционный портал «Инвестируй в регионы», который призван стать уникальным цифровым пространством, которое объединяет инвесторов по всей России, а также предоставляющие актуальную информацию по регионам Российской Федерации, условиям ведения бизнеса, мерам государственной поддержки и другим аспектам реализации бизнес-идей, тем самым способствуя улучшению инвестиционного климата в российских регионах. Уважаемый господин председатель, наращивание инвестиций в сектора СУР – ключ к устойчивому, всестороннему и инклюзивному восстановлению мировой экономики. Тем не менее, мы наблюдаем, как негативно сказывается стагнация мировой экономики, высокий уровень инвестиционной активности, высокий уровень неопределенности и волатильность финансовых рынков на бюджетных возможностей, возможностях стран региона по финансированию целей устойчивого развития. 
В этой связи отмечаем необходимость обеспечения слаженности функционирования международных валютно-финансовой и торговой систем, повышения их прозрачности и укрепления доверия к ним, также поддержки устойчивых и качественных инвестиций в инфраструктуру для создания новых высококвалифицированных рабочих мест, а также формирование прозрачной, стабильной и предсказуемой инвестиционной среды. Приоритетными направлениями финансирования, с нашей точки зрения, должны стать проекты в области развития систем здравоохранения, образования, санитарии, микрокредитования и других финансовых услуг, а также цифровые технологии. В свою очередь, одним из основных реципиентов этого финансирования должны стать микро-, малые и средние предприятия, роль которых в новых цепочках добавленной стоимости, по разным оценкам, будет только усиливаться. Подчеркиваем важность стимулирования частных инвестиций в устойчивое развитие. И информируем, что в России ведется разработка национальной платформы устойчивого финансирования и внедрение новых инструментов привлечения внебюджетных средств в зеленые проекты. В частности, в планах определить критерии для проектов развития, требования к системе их верификации, а также подготовить дорожную карту по разработке и внедрению мер, стимулирующих создание новых инструментов финансирования устойчивого развития в Российской Федерации. Мы готовы к обмену опытом со всеми странами ИСКАТа в области зеленых финансов и инвестиций. Благодарю за внимание. Thank you very much, distinguished delegate from Russian Federation. I now invite, invite the distinguished delegate from Pakistan to be followed by Nepal. Pakistan, please take the floor. Hi, greetings from Pakistan. Uh, I'm honored to be the part of this uh, August gathering and thank you for providing me with an opportunity to share my thoughts on this important topic. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the outbreak of pandemic, the COVID-19 has had wide ranging consequences across the world. Even the world's topmost economies are struggling hard to recover from the scenario. World Bank, highlighted that the global investment is expected to be reduced drastically in 2021 and the growing econ and the growing economies are likely to be worst hit in terms of low foreign direct investment by the pandemic pakistan being fdi seeking country is determined to strengthen its position through various measures uh, to capitalize on the post coronavirus disease scenario some of the existing and recently Introduced investment regimes and measures uh, that I'm going to share with you are the presence of special economic zones law in the country that offers a generous set of incentives like exemption from custom duty and income tax holidays to zone developers and enterprises. Uh, Governor of Pakistan has promulgated amendments in the tax laws to accelerate investment in the construction sector by introducing the Amendment Ordinance 2020 of industry to the construction sector and offers several incentives and time-bound tax relief measures for builders and developers originally in the 19th. Pakistan also has a liberal national investment policy. For instance, the policy provides for equal treatment to local and foreign investors. All economic sectors are open to FDI except a few. Uh, foreign equities up to 100% allowed, remittances of royalty, technical and franchise fee, profits, dividends, and capital and capital gains are also allowed. Foreign investment is fully protected by the Acts of Parliament in our country. Besides that, at the policy level, we have recently introduced the renewable energy policy the electric vehicles policy and mobile phone manufacturing policy to promote investment in these sectors. Ladies and gentlemen, I feel impelled to state that Pakistan has also significantly improved in the World Bank in Business Index and GEM 28 points from 136 to 108 among the 190 countries. Pakistan has been declared as one of the top 10 improvers in the Doing Business 2020 report which is at number six and we expect further improvement in the next report in addition to the already stated facts and figures 
I feel proud to state that Pakistan is strategically located to become Asia's premier trade, energy, and transport corridor and provides one of the biggest consumer markets in the world, having a population uh, with a population of over 207 million people, which is sixth largest in the world. 60% of this population is below the age of 30 uh, with talented labor force from unskilled to highly skilled professionals. It also goes without saying that Pakistan is also blessed with abundant uh, natural resources. So uh, having said this, uh, I believe uh, that all these efforts and aspects of our investment promotion are strongly uh, perceived to put Pakistan back on the uh, track of sustainable development in the post-COVID era. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, distinguished delegate from Pakistan. And I apologize, Nepal. I, I would like now to ask uh, distinguished delegate from Cambodia to take the floor. Please unmute You're Cambodia. muted. Uh, thank you, Jack. Can you hear? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jack. We thank the uh, UNS Cup for uh, having this uh, session for the uh, discussion on how we uh, can work uh, during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, to promote the investment uh, to our uh, country. Like other country, Cambodia is also uh, adapting the new way of uh, handling and facilitating the investment. The government has exerted its best endeavor to cope with the economic downfall by improving the investment facilitation where the Council for the Development of Cambodia has implemented a common IT platform to allow investors to register their uh, business company online. Uh, with this system, investors can receive notification online upon the approval uh, of the uh, final registration certificate. Moreover, the request for import duty exemption in the master list has also been uh, done via a uh, national single window, and this will allow the investor more easier uh, to uh, import their uh, raw material machinery uh, for the implementation of the project. And with regard to the uh, SME support scheme, Cambodia have introduced measures to help SME thrive amid COVID-19 pandemic, such as uh, fiscal stimulus, vocational training, and is in procedural process. To cope with the economic volatility posed by the pandemic, Cambodia have put forth seven rounds of release measures to support SME, such as subsidy, tax incentive, and loan support. In time of this great challenge, Cambodia experienced a minor decline and strive to maintain a resiliency in terms of investment promotion and attraction. As witness, Cambodia have approved a total of investment at 8.2 billion US dollar in 2020, marking a decrease of only 11.8%. Uh, uh, this is uh, the achievement that we done uh, compared to uh, last year, uh, 2019. And uh, as that 2019, we uh, witnessed the significant increase of investment, uh, more than 9 billion. Uh, it's mean 45.7% uh, increase compared to uh, 2018. The about trend from Cambodia to implement various facilitation measures to enhance the one-stop service and pursue to 
introduce new law on investment and law on the special economic zone uh, to serve uh, investment better. Cambodia applauded the initiative of the Committee on Trade and Investment of the US Cup to hold regular session uh, via online platform. And this is something uh, that we can explore a feasible policy recommendation related to FDI and provide policy advice as well as best practices on current and future work of investment promotion. This will also continue the momentum of investment trend and maintain supply chain as well as strengthen industrial value chain that is resilient in the midst of the pandemic. In this regard, Cambodia is working to create a supply your database to, in order to improve the linkage between foreign firm and domestic supplier. This measure may both facilitate investment and contribute to significant development impact, especially as some foreign firm report that they are having trouble finding qualified local partners. Cambodia have been in the effort to accelerate digital technology and promotion of FDI and promote FDI in climate resilient infrastructures and green energy for the green growth, as well as support local foreign SME in the region and global value chain. We also commit ourselves to uh, participate in the WTO uh, restructure uh, discussion to have a investment facilitation framework and Cambodia committed for that to make sure that uh, the region and the world will recover from this uh, disruption of the COVID-19 <laughs> pandemic. I thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, distinguished delegate from Cambodia. Now I'd like to uh, ask, take the floor from the distinguished delegate from Nepal to be followed by China. Nepal, please take the floor. Thank you, Chair. Is, is, is it audible? Thank, thank you, Chair. Is it audible? Yes. Uh, could you speak out? Can, can you can you hear louder? me? Yes. 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 Can Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Sir. Thank yes, you. Thank yeah. you, Chair. Uh, distinguished de delegates, eminent experts, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you very much and for providing this opportunity to uh, be part of the, uh, the seventh session of uh, trade and investment. Uh, I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to UNSCA for the, organizing this program because uh, it will be very instrumental to promote trade and investment in the region, in the entire region, Asia and Pacific. Yeah, foreign direct investment is regarded as one of the key drivers of economic development of uh, Nepal. Uh, government of Nepal is uh, highly you know, priority, prioritizing uh, this uh, policy and uh, making different initiatives to, uh, the, to invite, to in, induce more foreign direct investment. The investment climate of uh, Nepal is, uh, is improving as uh, the latest uh, doing business report shows. Uh, very significant improvement in our you know, parameter. We are now in the 94th position. That means the in investment uh, environment is gradually improving. And so we'd like to uh, invite more foreign direct in investment in Nepal. And uh, yeah, there are different uh, policy and uh, institutional initiatives that, that are being taken by government of Nepal. And uh, they, uh, you know, uh, we recently have uh, uh, introduced new legislation, foreign in, uh, investment uh, and uh, technology transfer act. And that is the key legislation that provides lots of in, in incentives and other facilities for the, uh, for the investors, including the return of the repatriation of the uh, uh, you know, investment. Yeah, we do have other, you know, single uh, staff service centers and other, you know, different platforms that uh, facilitate for the uh, smooth uh, in, uh, foreign uh, the investment. 
And more importantly, Governor Nepal has uh, recently opened up uh, agriculture sector, primary agriculture sector for foreign direct investment. We hope that uh, it will be very uh, supportive and uh, very, you know, uh, uh, it will contribute to the overall poverty reduction and the sustainable economic growth and uh, sustainable transition uh, from the, the ELDC. And in addition to this, uh, as uh, you know, we are in the or the working, partnering with the different agencies, uh, or we are working with the uh, regional forums very actively. We want uh, more collaboration uh, and how we can, you know, uh, uh, how we can uh, make the, the, you know, this forum can support the SMEs so that the foreign direct investment, there can be a good linkage between foreign direct investment or in large industries and the SMEs. In addition to this, uh, we would like uh, to work uh, together uh, to, you know, uh, to uh, invite, uh, to induce more foreign direct investment so that the, uh, our plan to graduate, uh, graduate from the LDCs can be sustainable and we can achieve the sustainable economic growth. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, distinguished delegate from Nepal. May I now invite the distinguished delegate from China to be followed by India. China, please take the floor. Thank <laughs> 受疫情影响呢帮助外资企业度过复工复产难关在中方政府和外资企业的共同努力下中国的稳外资政策取得了成效同时也呼吁大家共同打造公平透明的区域投资环境，努力恢复全球跨境投资增长，为全球经济持续复苏注入新动能。谢谢。Thank you very much, distinguished delegate from China. May I now invite the distinguished delegate from India? Please take the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the floor. Mr. Chair, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, it has been the continuous endeavor of the government of India to put in place an enabling and investor-friendly FDI policy by making policy reforms conducive to promote investment inflows into the country. The measures taken by the government on <clears throat> On the fronts of FDI policy reforms, investment facilitation, and ease of doing business have resulted in increased FDI inflows into the country. Both FDI equity inflows and total FDI inflows into India have shown a secular rise over the years, with 2019-2020 recording the highest annual FDI inflow in the last six years at US dollars 74.4 million provisional figures. 
FDI, FDI policy has been progressively liberalized and simplified across various sectors in the recent past to make India an attractive investment destination. Some of these sectors include insurance, pension, other financial services, asset reconstruction, companies, broadcasting, pharmaceuticals, single brand retail trading, construction and development, power exchanges, e-commerce activities, coal mining, contract manufacturing, digital media, insurance intermediaries, civil aviation, and the likes. FDI up to 100% is now permitted under the automatic route in most sectors and activities. The COVID-19 pandemic has drastically affected the investment climate in all economies of the world, causing a sharp decline in demand and supply equilibrium everywhere. India has been no exception to this unprecedented economic shock. Yet, investment sentiment in the Indian economy has been buoyed by the consistent and active intervention by the government. FDI equity includes during the financial year 2021 up to September 2020 were about 15% more than the corresponding period in 2019-2020. The FDI policy amendments notified on the 17th of September 2020 have been carried out to realize the vision of an Atma Nirbhar Bharat or what we call as self-reliant India. The reforms announced by the government under the ambit of the Atma Nirbhar Bharat or self-reliant India have opened up many sectors including the niche sectors such as nuclear energy and space for the foreign investors to partake in. The underlying tenet of the MarQ package is not about excluding India from the globe, but making it an integral part of the global value chains by improving its domestic competitiveness. With a view to support, with a view to support facilitate and provide investor friendly ecosystem to the investors investing in India, an empowered group of secretaries for investment has been constituted with the objective of fast tracking investments into the country. The government of India is working on setting up a single window system investment clearance cell for clearances and approvals of industry in the country. The ICC or the investment clearance cell will be a national portal that integrates the existing clearance systems of the various ministries and departments of the government of India and of the state governments and will have a single unified application form. Project development cells have been set up in all concerned ministries and departments in India to fast track investments in coordination between the central government and the state governments and thereby helping the growth of investable projects in India and in turn increasing domestic investments and FDI inflows. India has developed an industrial information system which provides a GIS enabled database of industrial areas including clusters, parks, nodes, zones, etc. across the country to help investors identify their preferred location for investment. An FDI monitoring cell has been established in, in India, which follows up with the applicant or the investor to expedite FDI approvals and follow up if there are any hurdles faced by them after receiving FDI approvals. A user-friendly portal called the Foreign Investment Facilitation Portal has been created for online filing of FDI proposals and interaction with the concerned administrative ministry or the department. Finally, India is committed to continue suitable, to continue with suitable policy interven interventions to promote both inward and outward FDI flows in the post COVID-19 era. I thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, distinguished delegate from India. With this, we finished with the interventions from the member states. And now, floor is open for observer organizations, intergovernmental organizations, and other entities. It's not the case, and I say there there are no more delegates who wish to take the floor. And can I take it that the Committee General endorses the findings and recommendations contained in the document for this agenda item 
and generally agrees with their recommendations as contained in the Secretary presentation? And does the committee wish to make any additional specific decision or recommendation on any topic under this agenda item? I see no comments. Then with this, we conclude the discussion on agenda item three. But before we adjourn, the Secretariat has an announcement. I would like to ask Ms. Ms. Mikic to take the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, the Secretariat would like to thank you for your active participation today. We would like to remind you that the session will start tomorrow, Thursday, 28 January at 10.30 Bangkok time and will adjourn at 1.30 uh, in the afternoon Bangkok time. We will take up agenda item 4A and the rest of the agenda items tomorrow. Kindly note the link to access the meeting through Kudo tomorrow will be the same as today. However, the link for YouTube tomorrow will change and is available on the committee website. Delegates who join with Kudo are welcome to join 30 minutes before the session starts for connection testing. I would like to remind you that each delegation will be kindly requested to fill in the evaluation survey for the session upon the closing of the committee. The link to the online survey is available on the committee webpage. We will appreciate your cooperation in providing your replies. I would also wish to inform all participants online that this afternoon we will have an online webinar, more of like a round table, on Asia-Pacific LDC's graduation, trade, and pandemic from 3 to 5 in the afternoon, Bangkok time, on Zoom. The details, including the program, speakers, and registration for both Zoom and YouTube are provided on the Trade and Investment Week webpage on ESCAP website, and we are sharing it now on the screen. I hope the conference... Uh, um, team can help me to share this link. Thank you very much. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Chair, for giving me the floor, and have a good afternoon. Thank you, Ms. Miyamikic. We now adjourn for the day, and we will reconvene tomorrow at 10.30 sharp. I have the pleasure to announce that my fellow Vice Chair, His Excellency Mr. Rajmat Budiman, Ambassador and Perm Representative to the ISCAP, Republic of Indonesia, will chair tomorrow's meeting and thank you very much for your all and today's session is adjourned.